Underwriting support for The Andy Draper Show is brought to you thanks in part to Paisan's Pizzeria. Located in downtown Medford, it's Italian done right. Give them a call, 541-772-3668. Hello everyone and welcome to the show. Today we'll be talking with Doina Sismith Jeffries, Women's Program Manager at VA Source in White City. Welcome to the show, Doina. Thank you. Um, A lot of us don't know that there are programs out there for women or even what program managers do in that situation, so we want to shed some light on that. Can you tell us what the Women's Program Manager does? Well, first of all, every VA has uh, a women's program manager, Mm -hmm. and the role is really to look at the entire facility and ensure that there are services uh, available for women and specific services for their unique needs. So the women program manager really is more of a coordinator working with all departments and departments heads to ensure services and if there are barriers then at that point in time we reach out to the various individuals to try and address any needs. Okay so first what got you to the Rogue Valley Doina? Well uh, about uh, 11 years ago My husband was looking for a change. We were living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I was working at the Albuquerque VA healthcare system. And he found a job here in the Valley. So shortly afterwards, my daughter and I moved out here and I started working at the VA Dom at that time and have continued with the VA source. So what made you work with veterans? You know, I have veterans uh, that have served in my family. Mm -hmm. My uncle, as a matter of fact, served uh, for over 30 years, made a career of it. And he served the end of World War II, Korean War, and in Vietnam. Uh, He, when he uh, retired, he had both PTSD, schizophrenia, and having been a paratrooper, a lot of muscular skeletal problems as well. So I've always had a tender spot for veterans and have always wanted to reach out and work with them. Okay, so we're thankful for his service and thankful that you're working with veterans today. Thank you. Uh, I, I, a lot of women have been in the military probably from the beginning, but there's really nothing said about that. Can you give us a little history on women in the military? Right. Well, actually, if you look back in history, going all the way back to, I'm going to say even Roman times, and then we have Joan of Arc. But getting to uh, more current, women served in the Revolutionary War. Uh, Many women ended up actually fighting alongside their husbands. There were some women that actually, in order to be on the front lines, disguised themselves as men to be able to serve. And then we go into World War I, where uh, the women volunteered. They they enlisted as volunteers, and uh, they served as clerks, clerical staff, uh, telephone communications, getting communications through. And when the war was over, they, in essence, uh, were released of their duties. Then we come to World War II. Over 400,000, 400,000 wow. women served uh, in World War II. And uh, many people are familiar with the Army uh, Corps. Uh, that I believe it was called the WAC. And for the Navy, the WAVES. Mm-hmm and uh, women served honorably there and then we come to present more present day and since post 9 11 over 290,000 women uh, have joined the armed forces and that number is continuing to grow okay so there's a rich history of 
women serving this country in the military. Yes. So we have a short video called to serve that we're going to play right now and it'll, we'll come back after we see this video. We are in a brutal struggle to win our independence from Great Britain. I fight alongside my husband. When he falls in battle, I carry on. I defy custom and fight to enjoy freedom or lose it with my life. Deborah Sampson, 4th Massachusetts Regiment. Brothers fighting brothers in a civil war that may cleave our young nation in two. I joined the battle as a woman and as a man. It would make your hair stand on end to be where I have been. A 700 mile march over shattered forest and torn earth. The dead lie in heaps and rows, friend and foe. Sarah Rosetta Wakeman, New York State Volunteers. I serve as a nurse, one of 2,000 sent to the battlefields to save the living as best I know how, to comfort the dying when hope is gone. I am Dr. Mary Walker, surgeon and spy, awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for service to the nation. When our troops fight in Cuba and the Philippines, I go with 1,500 others to nurse the men in the swamps and jungles where malaria and typhoid fever are a deadly enemy. Soon after the war, my value is recognized. Congress establishes the Army and Navy Nurse Corps giving women official military status for the first time. The country calls on me again when America goes to Europe to help our French and British allies in their war against Germany. I join the Navy and Marines, 12,000 strong, to free the men to fight. I serve as a clerk, a secretary, translator, draftsman, fingerprint expert. Yes, sir. A Signal Corps girl in France, where every order for troop movements comes over my lines. I serve as 10,000 nurses deployed to the combat zones, where bombs, bullets, and mustard gas kill and injure 400,000. I see those wounded boys, never a whimper. Then two bombs come crashing down, and pieces of steel and stone come screaming through our tent. Helen McClelland, Army Nurse Corps. When the wartime emergency ends, except for a few hundred nurses, we are all discharged, no longer needed. The attack on Pearl Harbor hurls America into war against both Japan and Germany, launching a deadly conflict that mobilizes the nation. I answer the call to join the military in massive numbers to free the men to fight. There is a deep satisfaction in saying to your country, in its hour of need, here am I, use me. Nearly 400,000 volunteer. I serve as a teletype operator at Allied Forces Headquarters in North Africa, a postal worker in France, getting the mail out to servicemen in all the combat battalions in Europe, a radio man on the coast, knowing I'm the main link 
between headquarters and the ships at sea. A voice in the control tower saying clear to land to pilots testing new fighter planes. A motor transport worker where three of us do the jobs of six men who went off to war. A tow pilot for aerial gunnery practice. A dangerous occupation when the men in training can't tell the target from the plane. I am a student in the Cadet Nurse Corps and I am 70,000 trained nurses caring for the wounded on land, at sea, and in the air. I serve at Anzio, trapped between the sea and the Germans. Bombs raining down. We are swamped with the gravest casualties. Many would have died if we were not so close to the front. Lieutenant Avis Daggett, Army Nurse Corps. The Japanese closing in on us. Everybody wounded. And one young soldier who has lost all four extremities says to me, I'm so sorry you girls are out here having to work like this. It just breaks your heart to hear talk like that. The Japanese capture 87 of us. By some miracle, we all survive. The last 67 are joyfully liberated after three years as prisoners of war. Lieutenant Hattie Brantley, Army Nurse Corps. At war's end, we are no longer needed. The military discharges all but a handful of us, and most women return eagerly to civilian life. But some of us have new ambitions. The war has shown that service women contribute greatly to the defense of the nation. I tell the U.S. Senate, any national defense weapon known to be of value should be developed and not allowed to rust or be abolished. Captain Joy Bright Hancock, U.S. Navy. Congress agrees. And in 1948, the Women's Armed Forces Integration Act gives permanent status to military women. Our numbers, ranks, and benefits are severely limited. But to us, it's a cause for celebration. The Cold War that follows World War II turns hot when we defend the Republic of South Korea from invasion by the Communist North. Thousands of service women are recalled and recruited. For those of us deployed as combat nurses, it is a harsh tour of duty. My hours are as long as I can keep standing. When they hear my voice, some boys think they're back in the States. One private says, my God, a real American nurse. Remove my bandages so I can see her. But he is blind. The Vietnam War escalates into a years-long conflict, creating a permanent manpower emergency and mounting casualties. I am deployed with 6,000 of my sister nurses on dangerous ground, where I suffer injury and death. Military policy keeps other service women out of the combat zone, until the need for support personnel grows so critical that the policy bends. I volunteer because there's a war going on, and as a career officer, I feel I should be part of it. Major Wilma Vaught, U.S. Air Force. A few hundred non-medical service women are finally deployed to Vietnam. The next two decades bring landmarks that transform our lives. In 1967, President Lyndon B. Johnson signs a bill that removes the 1948 caps on our numbers and our promotions. Within a few years, the chiefs of the women's programs become our first generals and admirals. In 1973, our military becomes an all-volunteer force. It recruits women by expanding opportunities.
Thanks to the women's movement, new laws forced the military to open even more jobs and to give service women equal benefits. Barriers tumble in nearly all non-combat jobs. Come right to Air Force 148. And we join our brothers at the military academies. We grow to 240,000. But it is no secret that there is still a deep level of resistance toward women and our incursions into all male preserves. In 1990, when America goes to the Persian Gulf, 40,000 of us deploy to operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Our jobs are classified as non-combat, but that does not keep us out of danger. Army Specialist 4, Melissa Rathbun Neely, and Army Major Rhonda Cornum are captured. 16 service women lose their lives. Major Marie Rossi, a pilot, is killed in a helicopter crash. I think if you talk to women who are professionally in the military, we don't, we see ourselves as soldiers. We don't really put it into perspective as men versus women. And uh, what I'm doing is no greater or no less than the man who's flying next to me or the men that are flying ahead of me. Major Rossi's words live on and Desert Storm blows away the old belief that women can't be warriors. By 1993, I see the laws that have excluded me from combat stricken from the books. I now fight in the air and on the high seas. As a soldier and Marine, I engage in all but direct ground combat. When I am deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq, I join my brothers in a new camaraderie. That's been awesome learning how to fight and employ the weapon systems and uh, become the best pilot that I need to be to bring me and my fellow pilots out back safely. To be one of the only female gunners in the battalion with a bunch of guys is actually kind of cool. You know, they have a lot of respect for me and I have a lot of respect for them. Men and women in the CDs, we all do the same thing. We're all supporting the same mission. We get a lot of, oh, Navy. Well, what ship are you on? I'm not on a ship. I'm a CB. We do construction. We support the Marines. So I'm watching these brave Marines under attack and I'm wondering how can I help them so we went very low altitude to try to get the enemy to disengage, and it worked. I don't know who those Marines were, and they don't know who I was, but at that day, we were all Americans trying to help each other out. I have deployed to Iraq twice. My last deployment that I spent over there, I got the opportunity to work with um, EOD, which is Explosive Ordnance Disposal. I'd like to feel that I'm capable of doing uh, whatever asked of me. I'd like to think that I am the kind of Marine, the kind of person, the kind of woman that would be very willing to lay down my life for someone next to me. A lot of times when you talk to women who are veterans, they really don't speak to that. Is there something going on there that keeps them from being able to speak or considering themselves as veterans? Yes, so even though women have served, as we've seen mm -hmm. throughout our history, uh, many women have felt that since they volunteered, and especially if you look at those that have been in World War II, Korea, so on, they feel that since they volunteered, they don't even recognize themselves as women. If you ask them, have you served in the military, they will say yes. But if you uh, have them raise their hand as to whether they're a, uh, a veteran, many of them will not. But unfortunately, not only do many women not view themselves as a veteran, in the general community, they're also often not viewed or considered or recognized as a veteran. And an example of that, uh, it was shared with me by some of the women veterans that they may go, for example, to a building supply store where there is a military discount. 
And they go in with their husband, and when they ask for the veteran discount, they're asked, oh, did your husband serve? And yet, they're the veteran, the husband did not serve. Uh, and many of these women have actually said that um, wherever they go, most people assume that their husband is the veteran. Uh, they have indicated that they actually felt invisible in terms of being a veteran. So you think that's part of just how our society is built to think that men are the warriors in society, or do you think there's other things that are in play, especially when women are going into positions that are power positions now, women are CEOs of companies, women are generals, lieutenants, they're commanders in the military. There can be some pushback from the male population and the mindset of our community at large uh, where we kind of are being discriminatory when yeah. we're looking. Yes, and I think sometimes uh, there is still this cultural sense uh, that the women really should not be out there in combat. You know, they should be more at home. Even though we have made a lot of advances, there still is some of that cultural pull. Okay, I know that I read a lot of, about different cultures and cultural diversity and and how different people feel about people, whether it's their race, their sex, what they should and should not be able to do, how they mm -hmm. look at them, and they should be in this place and not that place. Some kind of, when it comes to women, it's almost misogynistic to think that women aren't able to do all the things that they're capable of doing. Uh, so we have to really be careful uh, uh, and make people more aware of what's going on and that's what this is doing for me and hope yes. for a lot of other people who have no idea that these things are happening. Uh, in e your, exactly, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. I, what I wanted to say is that we really need to increase public awareness. We need okay. to increase public awareness of uh, women veterans service uh, and not to belittle their contributions because as you had mentioned, you know, they are colonels. They are out there uh, actually advancing in the military and very capable. And some of them have actually given the ultimate sacrifice. Others come home with visible and invisible wounds. And one of the things that uh, Oregon Department of Health actually um, uh, pardon me, Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs actually uh, put together was a campaign called I Am Not Invisible. I am not invisible, I mm. am a veteran. And uh, it started with Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs. They mm. displayed it in Washington, D.C. and the VA took that on, mm. took on the campaign. And so we have some pictures here from that campaign okay. actually recognizing some of our women veterans. When we put the call out for women veterans that wanted to participate in the I Am Not Invisible campaign, we had 41 that showed up. These are only a few. We have mm -hmm. women so in the National Guard. We had women in uh, the Air Force, the Navy. And I do want to point out specifically our 98-year-old women mm. veteran. She served in World War II, and sadly to say, she passed away just a couple months ago. But uh, these are all women warriors. Okay, so these are our local, the ones we see around us here, they are local, they're right in the yes. community that we're in right now. Okay, there are some events that happen uh, just to try to bring light and shine a light on those women who have done these things, these great things to help our country and to try to honor them in some way. Can you tell us a little bit about some sure, of those events? Sure. Um, one of the things that uh, Southern Oregon VA, the source does, 
is we have an annual what we call our Women Veterans Celebra Celebration pardon me, program mm -hmm. that um, we hold generally in August. This year it will be on Thursday, August 15th at In at the Commons. Mm -hmm. It's for the afternoon, generally beginning at one o'clock, and it is a wonderful time for all local women veterans to get together, but it is also not only for veterans, but all women that have served, including those currently serving, are invited to this. Okay, so you want all women to get there, come together. Yes. Rebels with each other, say we're here. Okay. Um, are there other events that go on? Yes, there are. Uh, we have, uh, in honor of our women veterans, we also uh, are having next week, as a matter of fact, is a National VA Women's Health Week. And so next week on Wednesday the 15th, we are going to be doing a Women's Health Open House so that, again, our local women veterans can come and they can see the VA, see the VA clinic, meet some of the staff, and get information as to what we provide and answer any questions for them. Uh, that is one thing, and the VA is also, we are looking at starting on June the 6th, a women veterans whole health group that is specific for women veterans to be able to take charge of their own health care. Okay, when you talk about women and the VA and serving in the VA, we'll come back, we're gonna take a little break here and we'll come back and I wanna talk a little bit about the services women are, are uh, able to access through the VA. Okay. Mm -hmm. 